Thank you for sharing that, Linda. Uh, she told me this morning that that is the reason he learned to play the piano, was he wanted to learn to play that song. Uh, I can't think of, probably there's not too many more difficult ways to, to undertake something than to decide, I just want to play something. But that's, that gives it, to, uh, gives it up to him for uh, effort and ambition. So anyway, uh, keep him in your prayers tomorrow as he uh, has those kidney stones removed. Pray that that'll go well and he'll recover quickly. Anyway, we are spending the month of January uh, on this word dwell. Uh, and I want to do something a little bit different today. I do this once in a while, not so much as preach, but as read a lot of scriptures, kind of in, a, in an order that is a theme based around my mind. So if you have a Bible, you're not going to be able to keep up today, let me just be honest, because we're going to just go from one to the other, uh, all the way from Exodus to Hebrews, I think. Uh, but they will be on the screen for you. I've told Eli to get that finger ready and keep up with us. Um, so we're going to do a lot, of different, a lot of different verses and walk us through one of the things that Scripture tells us about the nature of God. Uh, so I guess the, the thesis this morning would be the idea that God wants to dwell with His people. And I'm going to show you the various ways and times in Scripture where He's done that. Uh, and I told you earlier this morning as I began to put this message together, so many verses, I cut so many out. It's almost... Uh, have you ever heard... Um, you probably never prepared a message, but there's this... Not a joke, but it's a, an illustration among pastors that a sermon is like an iceberg that like 90, 80 or 90 percent of it is below the surface and that's usually what we end up cutting out and what you see is just the tip of the iceberg and that's certainly true today because I had so many things that I ended up uh, not having time for but anyway uh, so it's this old cliche this morning for you about drinking from a fire hose so uh, buckle up whatever you need to do get, wake up maybe and get ready for that so having said that there's a lot of scripture uh, so but let's let's start with a word of prayer father we are thankful that we have your word this morning to guide us Thankful that you are there and a very uh, real and present reality for us. As we open your word, uh, let us be open to hear what you want to say to us through it. Uh, may I be uh, able to communicate it clearly, uh, my thoughts. Uh, may your spirit make it sink in and just soak it up. Uh, and we ask that, your blessing, uh, that blessing on the, your word this morning. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. So I guess I, would, I wanted to start with a a fundamental question about human existence and maybe you have an answer for this if you do I'd love to hear it there are many different answers uh, and I don't expect you to have an answer right off because this is a very philosophical question so here's the question why did God create man I'm not expecting you to answer that but think about that for a second why did God create man we're going to go through one of the possibilities this morning in, in Scripture. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because none of us were there when God created us. He didn't say to us, this is why. We do have His Word to kind of give us some guidelines. But we could probably come up with many different answers. Uh, and, some would, and some would get us closer than others. But there are some things that we do know. God did not create man because He needed us. There's not something lacking in the character or the person of God that said, you know what, I'm just kind of, I just wish there was somebody here. There's a, a worship song that pastors and worship pastors discuss. One of the lines, we've actually sung it before, and Tanya knows that I don't like this line, but the line says, you didn't want heaven without us. And every time we sing that song, I'm thinking that as if God needed us for something at all. When we're talking about this omnipotent, all-powerful God, there's nothing needy about him. So the fact that he didn't want heaven without us kind of theologically bothers me a little bit. We don't do that song a lot, and sometimes I, we don't sing that verse of the song. Um, but the discussion in that line somehow makes it seem that God was somehow unsatisfied or incomplete without human existence, and we know that that is certainly not true. Um, every time I, I think about uh, that theological concept and that line, I hear a quote, and I don't know who said it, I wish I could remember, but I hear a quote from an old preacher in my mind saying, God is God all by himself. He don't need nobody else. Now, I don't know who said it, but I wish I could give him credit for it this morning. But that's what I hear, and that sticks with me because that's actually the truth of the situation, is God did not need us. So we, that cannot be the answer to why did God create man. Maybe something else has come into your mind, and I thought, well, we'll just, let's just pick one strand this morning and go that way. I think it is possible that God created men to dwell with us. The catechism, the, I forget what it is, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Did anybody do the catechism? Maybe Presbyterians? 
Maybe it was just me. I grew up Baptist, but somehow I learned some catechism. But there are, uh, you guys know what a catechism is, right? You, that's a series of questions. It's a way of, it's probably a very old, it's probably 400 years old now, a way of helping students to remember things. You ask a question and there's a, an answer that they are supposed to repeat. And I remember doing this in first and second grade. But the first question, as soon as I say it, you'll know how, the, how it ends because you've heard it before. What is the chief end of man? No catechism people here. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever is the answer that the students would say back. Now there's 107 of those questions and we're not going to get through the first one today. Um, but I thought that there's probably some truth in that little simple catechism. That the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. He wants to be with us. He wants us to enjoy His presence. So that's how we come this morning to our title, The God Who Dwells With His People. And next week we're going to flip that around and talk about the people who dwell with their God. But we find pretty early in the scriptures that God desired to dwell with among his people. You remember in the Garden of Eden that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And that is when the problems began because their disobedience, that sin that they committed began this separation between God and man and God's holiness, his self-existence, his not, his, his not any need for man has created this, this gap between us and him, our sinfulness, our disobedience, and so forth. Uh, and that was even from the book of Genesis. You remember that through that, then Ab he came to Abraham and through the nation of Israel, God still pursued his people. Have you ever thought about why it wasn't in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned? God said, you know what, let's just start over. Thank God that he didn't. But he could have at that very moment said, you know what, they've been disobedient, they've been sinful, I'm going to try over, I'm going to start again and find people that will be obedient. But you remember that he didn't do that through the nation, through the person of Abraham, the nation of Israel, God came and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation and all that sort of thing. Then we come to a passage in Exodus 25, fairly well on in the biblical story, and you'll, you'll remember how it goes. In Exodus 25, 8, God says, then have them, the people of Israel, make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. This is his goal, his stated purpose. The reason for building a tabernacle was, have them build it, and I will live there with them. Now, you remember that prior to this, they were in Egypt. And do you remember God's presence with them before? A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God is still there with them, leading them out of that, and says, now that we have come through that stage, I still want to dwell with my people. Have them build a sanctuary. Now there's two words in that short verse that are very important to us. The first one is sanctuary. The Hebrew word here means to be holy or to make holy. Have them make a place where I can bring my holiness to, to be among them. And the second one there is the word dwelling. And we'll get to that in a second. But we know, and I said this in a, a second ago, we know that the reason God could not dwell among us was his holiness and our sinfulness. This is the gospel story. This gulf of separation has to, be, has to be compromised, has to be breached somehow. Just last week we sang the song with these lyrics, Oh the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh the grace that brought it down to man. Oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary is how that song goes. That's the same gap that we're talking about this morning, this gap between God and man. Keep in mind that as we consider uh, God dwelling with us, keep that gap in mind. And the second word in that verse, Exodus 25, is the word dwell. Now, it kind of means settled, but it also, you remember the word from, of course, you're a bunch of Hebrew scholars, right? The word Shekinah glory. You've probably heard somebody preach about that before. But it talks about the Lord's presence is what that means, God's presence with us. And in the Greek, it comes across as to take up residence. And that's where we've been with this word dwell in the month of January. Commentator says about that, by commissioning the building of the tabernacle, a portable worship center, the Lord showed that he intended to live among the Israelites more closely than when meeting with them on Mount Sinai. You remember the distance he had to keep? He was on the, the mountain giving Moses the commandments. No animal or people could touch the mountain because of God's holiness under, under penalty of death. So that's what happens. Now God says, build a tabernacle, a sanctuary, so that I can dwell with my people. A few verses later, a few chapters later, in Exodus 29, God says it again. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. There's two parts to this. I'm going to dwell there, and they will worship me and serve me. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So here we have it twice already 
In the book of Exodus, this is what he said, God has said this. And repeatedly throughout Scripture, we'll see God's desire. I wanted to kind of throw those out to say this is God of the Old Testament. When we remember sometimes the, the God of wrath and anger that sometimes people stereotype that way. But it says he wants to live with his people. The problem was we and the people of Israel could not live up to the requirements of being holy around God. And live up to those to love God and pursue him only. Men's hearts are fickle. Our hearts are fickle. We are led to pursue many other things. Yet this doesn't dampen God's desire. Scripture continues to record men's failures. And you could say that's, that's pretty much what the rest of the Old Testament is. This idea of God pursuing men and men fleeing and disobeying and so forth. So then we come to the book of Ezekiel. And while it is a very weird book and a lengthy book, there's one key passage in, in the book of Ezekiel that you're probably familiar with, the Valley of Dry Bones. But one of the things that happens in the book of Ezekiel is the presence, the glory of God, leaves the temple. And it talks about that in Ezekiel chapter 10. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's what's going on in the book of Ezekiel. I want to read this, these verses from Ezekiel 37. That even though God's presence has left the temple, he has the prophet Ezekiel say this in chapter 37. Uh, verse 26. I will make a covenant of peace with them, the nation of Israel. It will be an everlasting covenant. Once again, he's trying to unite himself with men and be able to dwell among them. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. After all this sin, after all this disobedience, this is still what God says, I'm going to do this. I'm still going to pursue them relentlessly. Verse 28 there of Ezekiel 37. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. So we know what happens after the book of Ezekiel and after the Old Testament. There is about 400 years between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew where Israel hears nothing. God has prophesied that he has a, re a redeemer, a Messiah coming. But man, that 400 years must have been a long time. As Israel relies on the prophets and trusting and hoping in God and his promise that he wants to dwell with them and there's just nothing but silence. And, rec and God recognizing this distance between men and this silence and the fragility and the sinfulness of man realize that dwelling in a tabernacle is not going to work. It will not be enough. Men will not be able to keep their part of the covenant. So he knew another way would be necessary. Someone who would close the gap once and for all and offer a permanent eternal sacrifice. And so, as we often read at Christmas time in John chapter 1 verse 14, the Word, and you remember verse 1, the Word that was with God in the beginning, capital W, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Not only God of the Old Testament desires to dwell among us, now He says, I'm going to take a human form, I'm going to become like a human and make my dwelling among them. He says, we have seen His glory the glory of the one and only. He is the glory of God the Father who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You remember the passage in Matthew that we also read at Christmas. All this took place, this word becoming flesh, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Dwell. God wants to dwell with his people. There it is again. You remember Paul writes in the book of Colossians, talking about Jesus, says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Everything that is holy and divine about God is also in the person of Jesus. And through him, here's the plan, here's how we're going to span that gap, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And we come to the gospel story that we love so much. So we've seen the prophets say it. We've seen God say it. We've seen why God sent Jesus. But actually there's verses that Jesus himself understands the purpose of why he's here. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us. You remember the story in Luke chapter 2 when as a young boy Jesus had somehow wandered off from his parents. And after, I forget, was it days they were looking for him? Which there's a whole other story there. How does that society work? Maybe he was with other family or whatever. But when they finally find him, what does he say? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I'm where I'm supposed to be. 
He doesn't say, where's Joseph? He doesn't say, I'm in his house. I'm in my father's house. He's, he's here for another purpose. He's already sensed it at a young age. And later in his ministry, the Pharisees accused Jesus and the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus' response to them in that moment is this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 6. says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What's he saying? This temple thing that did not work in the Old Testament, God now has a new plan. Something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath day that you're so struck with, my Father created that. So we get this idea that Jesus realizes he's here for a greater purpose. And we go through all the Gospels and we go progress through the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. We realize that this is, in fact, an, an editorial account of what Jesus' life was about in Hebrews chapter 10. The author of Hebrews records for us the problem that originated in the Old Testament with the high priest's sacrifices. And he tells us about this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. He says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices. You remember this is how it worked in the Old Testament. A priest would stand there, sprinkle blood on the altar. God would forgive the sins of Israel. Once a year, a goat would come in. They would put their hands on a goat, put all their sins on it, and the goat set free to wander in the wilderness. This was how the Old Testament covenant was, was fulfilled, and men said we are going to fulfill our promise to God. And yet it never worked. The author of Hebrews continues, says, But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's talking about another priest. Go back to chapter 9 of Hebrews. It says, For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So this is not an earthly tabernacle anymore where a, a human earthly priest sacrifices for our sins. This is a divine being who stands in the presence of God offering payment for our sins. So in that verse continues, verse uh, 25, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. He doesn't have to do this over and over. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. See the contrast there? The priest is offering the blood of an animal. The priest that stands before God for us now has offered his own blood. And it is once and for all, verse 26. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And God's people said, there's a new and better way. Verse 27 there in Hebrews continues, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Isn't it funny how, uh, even as I'm looking at these, these passages now and going back to Old Testament prophecies and God's promises, he always seems to add something on. Not only is, is it once and for all, not only is it Christ's own blood, I'm going to come back a second time. He can't stop from blessing us. And helping us to enjoy him forever. And this is the story about the redemption of mankind. The gospel story. The story that we've told for years. So let's bring all of that knowledge from the Old Testament. Through the book of Hebrew, Ezekiel and into Hebrews. Knowing what we know about Jesus. Where does that leave us today in this moment in this room? Because there are many people in our world today who say, well, that's nice what God did a long time ago through the person of Jesus. And I can believe all that, but God is so absent and distant from my life. Just like the rest of Scripture, fortunately, there's more. There's more good news to this story. It doesn't end there. You remember in the life of Jesus, he had these 12 disciples, and he would tell them that he was going to die. and They didn't want to believe it, and Peter kind of rebuked him in a way. Well, in Matthew, the very last chapter of Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and you know this passage of Scripture. He said this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The very last verses of Matthew. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Hang on a second. The disciples must have said, Holy Spirit, what are you talking about? The Father, yes, we know. Jesus, the Son of Man, Son of God, we know. But what's this Holy Spirit? Jesus continues on. Why would he give them all 
three credit. Why at this point would Jesus bring them all up? Because our Bible teaches us that they are all co-equal and co-existent. We're present from the beginning of creation. And all-knowing and all-powerful in every sense of the word, God. Jesus finished that phrase by bringing those three parts of the Trinity up. And he says this, and teaching them... To, he's telling what the disciples are doing. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then what does he say? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, how's that going to happen? Because we know after the resurrection he ascends into heaven and the disciples are there. Kind of hopeless, kind of desperate, wondering what's going to happen next. But Jesus said and promised, I'll be with you to the end of the age. How could this be if Jesus was not to remain on the earth? Fortunately... John recorded a passage for us that tells us what Jesus meant. John chapter 14, Jesus says this, talking to his disciples again. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, probably comforter might be what your passage reads, to be with you forever, the Spirit, capital S, of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Isn't that the truth? Those people who look and say, well, what God did was so far in the past, neither sees him nor knows him today. But he says, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. He's foreshadowing what's going to happen after he leaves. Skip to John chapter 16, verses 5. Jesus 5 says, now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Probably because at that point they didn't believe he was going to go anywhere. He says, because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. When I say that, it bothers you, it disturbs you. But I tell you the truth, this part of, this verse, next passage of Scripture has always fascinated me, for Jesus to say this. It is for your good that I am going away. Can you imagine the disciples in that moment? Saying, what in the world are you talking about? We have spent three years of our life with you. You have done amazing, supernatural, incredible things, healing people, feeding people, and now you're saying that it is for our good that you're going away. That had to be a shocking statement for the disciples to hear in that moment. And then he, but he continues and says, Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He's not going to leave him just hanging there with this sense of desperation. He says, there's somebody else that's coming. Then you remember the Bible story goes on and we find out that this other person shows up in Acts chapter 2. Remember what happens in that story. Look at verse 14. After the, the people start to speak in all these tongues so that everybody can hear. And here's what Peter does at that day on Acts chapter 2 verse 14. It says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, I can just hear him. Just, I can just hear this in my mind. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem. Because Peter is a Jew to the core. He wants to talk to the Jews first. And all you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Thank goodness Peter's going to do this. Because when Jesus answers questions, sometimes you still have questions and more questions. Now we need a simple man like Peter to explain it to us. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Verse 15, these men are not drunk because they've been speaking in tongues and people said, oh, they've been drinking already. People says, Peter says, that's not true. It's only nine in the morning. And he says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What is happening here in Acts chapter 2 Peter stands and says, this is what Joel said was going to happen. And here's what Joel said. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. This sounds like even a greater thing than Jesus promised. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. In verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the work of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit is supposed to be doing in this day and age for us today. Let's skip down a few more verses while Peter's still talking there, verse 37. And it says, As this is going on, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They are so desperate now. They've seen what's happening. They've heard this promise. And they said, Now what? Peter replies, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for who? 
For all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And we fall under that last bracket there. Both time-wise, geography-wise. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is the active work and presence of God in our day and age. Peter has to explain it. And you remember Apostle, the Apostle Paul talks about it also. He describes what has happened in Romans chapter 8. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, which is the goal, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the Spirit, capital S, dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The same Spirit that Jesus talked about, the same Spirit that He came in, in the sense of a, and as sent from the Father, is the same one giving life to our mortal bodies. And Paul says that over and over in his letters to the churches. Ephesians chapter 2, he says, And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. There's that word dwell again. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? I don't know how many more times we can see this, this message throughout Scripture. It says if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy. And now that holiness gulf has been spanned. You are that temple. Because when God sees us now, he sees not our holiness and our righteousness, but Jesus Christ. That priest who stands before him every day who offered his own blood once and for all. So we come to the end of this today that across all measures of time, across all cultures, across all languages and all peoples, if you can hear me today, know this. God's desire has been for his people to know him and for him to dwell with them. He is not a God who remains distant. He has not created the world and then cut out. He's not apathetic and far away. His presence is real and powerful. His place is the hearts of men. His purpose is to dwell with and in us. He's not absently watching. He is presently grieving for those who are so far away still. He's mourning the sin and the pain of men. Unfortunately, so many in our world are ignoring the presence of God and the power of the Spirit. Go back to the book of Acts briefly, chapter 7. Stephen stands before the people and tries to explain this. He says, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. He's contrasting with the Old Testament tabernacle. He says, as the prophet says, he's talking about Isaiah, Heaven is, excuse me, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What kind of house could you possibly contain the Holy of Holies, God Almighty? What could you possibly build with man, man's hands and man's supplies that would contain him? He continues on quoting Isaiah, Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? Then Stephen turns it and gets himself in trouble. Here's where he goes. He says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Ouch. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He called them out. You remember what happened? They stoned him. Right after that, he was stoned for saying this to the people. And I should tell you that we who believe in the power of Spirit and the power of God today should, should expect much of the same from those people who are distant and far from God, whose hearts are, are cold and callous to the reality of God. This truth of the presence of God is powerful and life-altering, but it is not easily received. It requires humbling and repentance. You probably remember the fact that in the time that you came to Christ, that you were humbled in that moment. When you became aware of your sin, realizing, I'm in big trouble here. I am destined for an eternity apart from God. My sins have sent me there. And you became humbled in that moment and you repented as Peter preached there in the book of Acts. Do you remember what Jesus said about this process? For the gate is narrow 
And the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. What a tragic statement for Jesus to say that. Those who find it are few. He said, again, I tell you, it is in the book of Matthew, he said, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Don't make too much out of the word a rich man there because we're all rich men classified based, based on what they're talking about and, and comparing it to. Even Jesus said this is not going to be easy. You're going to be humbled. And that's what keeps so many people from following Christ. So we've come a long way through a lot of passages today. I'll send you the notes tomorrow so you can read through all of those verses again. You probably didn't even get all, able to write all the references down. But I wanted to communicate to us that this picture of the grand picture of Scripture is that God desires to dwell with His people. And He'll do it by any means possible. He's constantly pursuing us, even when our hearts are distant and cold. And if you're within the sound of my voice this morning, maybe you're watching the recording. Be assured that God is pursuing you and wants to be with you and have you experience the transforming power that is available. And I guess to summarize all this this morning, I would take us way back to the book of Exodus where we started. When Moses realized that God was taking them someplace, but that God might not go with them. My prayer is that this would be the cry of all of us this morning. Moses says this in Exodus chapter 33, verse 15. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? So to bring that into today, how do people know that God is pleased with us? He is with us. Emmanuel. Moses says, what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? That's what distinguishes the identifying marks of a Christ follower is the presence of God and the Holy Spirit in their life. May that be our prayer this morning. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Let's pray. Our Father, we are once again reminded of the power of your word as we have read so many passages this morning. But we are still in awe of your presence and the power that we have that you would be present with us. We do pray this morning that we would say, as Moses said, if you are not going with us, do not send us up from here. Lord, help us not only this month of January that we have committed to this word to dwell, to dwell in your word and in your presence, but may it continue on through the rest of the year. May we fall so in love with your pursuit of us and so in love with you that we don't want to be anywhere else. We thank you again for the time in your word this morning. We thank you that as, as always your promises are true and faithful. And as you, as you said to Moses, we pray that you would also say to us, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.